Do it with Mike Campbell. Uh, these are all just related to the record for this evening, Okay, cool. Uh, so just, you know, same same kind of... You know, let, let's let's swap it over. So the, you go over here. So he's looking the other way. You know what I mean? So they're not all looking the same way. All right. There's pictures of Jimmy Reed, Rosetta Tharp, Robert Johnson all over the walls in there. Yeah. Is there like a deliberate vibe in there, or is it just... Has that just happened over time? It just happens. It's just stuff we like, you know. You ever uh, see them? You ever get inspired looking at those pictures? All the time, yeah. How can you not get inspired looking at Muddy Waters or Jimmy Reed? How was making this record different than making other records? It was a lot record? different. It was, uh, uh, we haven't done a live record, like a proper live record where the whole band plays together at the same time, you know, with no headphones. And uh, we really wanted to do that this time, and it was great, you know, because all the solos and most of the vocals are live on the floor. And there's no overdubs to speak of, so it's a very organic record, and very real. How does that change things? Well, it made things uh, more uh, uh, in intense in a way, because everybody had to really, there's no fixing it later, you know, going back and tidying it up later. It's like, it, you're gonna count it off from, from now to the end of the song, no mistakes, you know, what you play is what you get, you know, and that really makes everybody focus in and try hard, you know. When all you guys are together in a room, is there, is there, a, is there something that happens that would never kind of happen if it was the kind of the multi-track thing? Oh, absolutely. It's, um, it's that mysterious quality X, you know, that you can't, I mean, you can make a record with one guy at a time and you can kind of make it sound like everybody played at the same time, but there's one thing that's always missing, and that's that chemistry in the air, that kinetic friction in the air that you can feel when somebody hears something and they respond to it and they respond to it, and it's got this give and take. You can only get that when everybody's playing at the same time. Tell me how a song on this record starts. Like, how does it begin its life in the room? Well, whoever wrote the song, like Tom writes most of the songs, he would bring it in and he would have a sketch of the lyric and some chords. And he would say, here's this song, and he'll start playing it, how he was playing it when he was sitting at home. And the whole band will listen, and as we become familiar with what he's doing, we might join in. And pretty soon everybody's joined in. And by the time he gets to the end of the song, a lot of times we have a vibe going that fits the song. It just seems to work that way. A uh, couple of songs that I wrote, I would do a demo at home, instrumental demo, and give it to Tom, and he would work on some lyrics. And in that case, we'd bring it in and we'd play the demo as there's a demonstration of what we're going for. Then we'd put that away and go in and approach it like the other songs, you know, put the lyrics up and start playing it. And uh, just use the, the demo as kind of a rough template. Was there a, uh, was there unexpected things that happened in like directions where the songs went that you wouldn't have normally? Yeah, all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny to watch Tom when he brings the song in, because sometimes he's, he's really set on how he wants it, and sometimes he's not. Sometimes he just wants the band to bring something to it because he's not sure. And sometimes if he's really sure, the band will do something off, and he'll go, wow, that's better than what I was hoping for, or, or not, you know. But sometimes surprises will happen where we'll have maybe an, a rough idea this song will be this type of song. And then when everybody starts playing, it'll morph into something else, you might change the rhythm or the tempo or make it a waltz or whatever, whatever it takes to make some chemistry happen. Corny question. What, what does the word mojo mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> mojo is your spark, isn't it? It's your creative spark to me. I mean, you know, it can be whatever you want it to be. I mean, first time I heard the word mojo was mojo hand in some old blues song, you know, some kind of mysterious voodoo or something. but. It's really your mojo is your your source of energy, I think. You know? And, and um, how will it be to play these songs live? Do you think it should be great because we played them live in the studio. We already kind of know them live, you know. So we basically just play them like we already know them. The other songs in, in the past, when you build a song up one by one, and you make that kind of record, and you get to rehearsal, and it's like, oh my God, how do we learn how to play this live and make it work? But these songs, we've already done the work, so it should be pretty easy. What's left in terms of, I mean, you guys have made hit records and done this for so many years. How do you challenge yourself? Like, how do you still take a risk? Well, you, you take a risk to, to uh, 
to get your mojo going. I mean, you, 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 you know, we've done a lot of records now, and and you, we have we've done a lot of records that, that people identify that and like, and that's kind of a, a, a quality we have to measure up to each time. So you're trying to to match your best thing and one better if possible, and sometimes it's a challenge. But aside from that, you just want to have fun, you know. Especially the older you get, you just want to really enjoy the process, you know, whether it sells or not. You want to enjoy those moments because they're really precious, you know. And that's is, what we keep doing. Is there uh, a more, <laughs> is that become more uh, apparent as you get older? Well, it becomes more precious because you, you, you treasure those moments, you know, that are, that are magical. And you, you always want more of that, you know. And you can't always conjure it up. You just have to kind of be there and wait for it to happen. But when it happens, it's pretty magical. You know, it's like a religious thing. Um, you're, you're really front and center on this record with this guitar. There's a lot of lead guitar, yeah. Well, I got a new guitar, so Tom saw my guitar. He said, let's, let's make a record around that guitar. Which we kind of did. When he first played me the record, he said, I really wanted Mike to be, I really want people to think of Mike in the terms of the great guitar players that, that get more due, because Mike is so melodic and so able to, to make these hit songs. Sometimes people take his talent for granted. And was there any discussion of that going into it? You know, he said something similar to me. You know, he said we want to make, he didn't say all that, all the sugary stuff, but uh, he said we want to, let's make a record that's live and that really has the guitar up front. You know, it's like, a, in, say like a Jeff Beck record or a, Jimmy Page record where the guitar is is up front and the band is behind it and let that sort of be our our goal you know and I had this new guitar and it was a perfect guitar for that so we approached it with with that intention and every time I'd want to change guitar he said no we got to stay with that one guitar because we're going to do what we started out to do we're going to make this this album with lots of that guitar and it'll build everything around it so. uh, will you play that guitar live <laughs> <laughs> in town, I will. At home, I mean, in, in LA, I will. But I don't want to carry it on the road. It's it's too too valuable. But I'll get another one that's close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, tell me a little bit about the lineage of this music, because lyrically and and uh, the rhythms and everything. I mean, I hear a lot of Delta stuff. I hear a lot of yeah. Sunny Boy and mm. uh, Robert Johnson and things like that. Um, was that a conscious effort, just? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we grew up in Florida, you know, we grew up a lot around a lot of blues and country music, and um, we've we've done flavors of that in our albums, you know, over the years, but we've never really tapped right into that, you know, into the blues sort of vibe that, that we grew up on. And this album, we kind of wanted to stay in that ilk and see what we could tap out of that, you know, stay away from the pop stuff for this one record, just try to channel the blues that we grew up in, you know, like Muddy Waters, Jimmy Reed, um, Lightning Hopkins, Helen Wolf, that stuff, we love that. That's some of our favorite music. When we sit around listening to music, that's what we listen to. And we grew up listening to that, you know. In, our, in Florida, in the South, there's a lot of that music on the radio when we were growing up. And we soaked a lot of that up, so we just figured, why not see if we can bring some of that out, you know. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, most Tom Petty and Heartbreaker records, there seems like this chase for a perfect song, like <laughs> what the Beatles could do, and the, you know, the, yeah. what Tom can obviously do, and right. and maybe, maybe it is, it, maybe it was always hard to just say, look, let's just let's do yeah. these more story-based blues songs and not chase that pop record or something. Yeah, I, I, I that was kind of the conscious thing, and I think fortunately we're lucky that we can do that, you know, because we're not counting on a hit single for our mortgage this month, but. Uh, we, so we have the artistic freedom to, to do this, and so that's what we want to do. And that's what that's where we're having fun right now. I notice there's a lot of answers, call and response, in terms of Tom's lyrics, and then kind of answering it in, in a very, very traditional blues way. Yeah. Is that kind yeah. of uh, deliberate? It's it's inst it's uh, instinctive. It's not necessarily deliberate. It's the way we've always played. You know, whatever kind of song it is, there would be a voice, and then a Ben Mon or I might find a, a a line that answers it or fills in the holes. We've always kind of done that. On this album, we're just kind of do it in more of a blues framework. It's the same kind of thing we've always done. Uh, have you talked about losing your mojo? I mean, have there been times when 
you can't find that spark and and you know well it's always there sometimes it's more intense than others but uh songwriting sometimes you get stuck in songwriting and you wonder like where did it go is it ever going to come back you know like please you know and you bust your ass working and like, it's just not there and then all of a sudden a little light goes on oh it's here it is thank you very much you know and then it's gone <laughs> like where did it go you know it's kind of just kind of being aware and open but it's, it's always kind of there lurking if you can just tune into it and i i suppose having this band that you've played with for so long helps with that right oh yeah yeah it's such a great band and everybody is so I mean, we played together a long time and we have a lot of uh, chemistry and, and, and we we have a, uh, a quality about this band that we can play like between Ben and Tom and me and the rhythm section we pretty quickly can find the right places that work together without stepping on each other's toes you know, nobody overplays everybody plays within the song and it's very um, some of those mysterious things, you know. I noticed when we were filming uh, uh, Something Good Comes, or Something Good Coming, there was a moment where I, it was, I, don't know, I guess it wasn't, it was emotional for me to watch it, but I really noticed a lot of just kind of listening going on, and a lot of mm -hmm. like, but was it, were you taking stock of the moment there and hearing that song differently? Or? Well, I was remembering when we cut the track, and it was like that, you know, Tom had the song, and we did it pretty quick. He kind of played it down, and I came up with a little lick, and Ben Mike came up with a lick, and it, we knew, we all knew, this is working, you know? We said, okay, stay with that. You know, we kind of got on that one uh, wavelength, kind of just wrote it home. And when we were doing it the other day, I kind of remembered, like, oh yeah, this is, it's just a very, uh, really lucky moment for us, <laughs> you know? When that happens, it's really lucky. Did you ever look over at, say, Ben Mon or Ron, and just look at, you know, like, I've spent my life with these guys, and yeah, occasionally, but I'm usually working, you know. <laughs> Last question, and I'll let you go inside. Um, do you think that this kind of this? kind of ability to play and to know, to do you think it's dying do you think do you think that what you guys are doing will not be repeated by future generations what the Allman Brothers did what you know bands that really know how to play together do you think that's a dying art no no I don't and I, I say this because my son plays and he has a band uh, they're not they don't have any big designs of you know having maybe a career out of it but they still get it, you know. We get together, we'll play a little gig, we'll practice together, and, and um, I hope that never dies. I don't think it will. I mean, you know, there, it's, it's an interesting question, though, because a lot of great people have gone before us that are gone now, you know, and when, like, who's going to fill those shoes, that old statement. Um, I don't know. I think there will always be people playing music together. I mean, whether, whether it'll be a new Allman Brothers or a new Led Zeppelin, who knows? We'll have to see. But I don't think it'll ever die. It'll just it'll morph into something else. Yeah, I just wonder if it, it'll keep getting smaller. Like people will be forgotten. And well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, it's an interesting question. And maybe in, you know, 80 years, rock and roll will be like Beethoven. You know, you'll go to the classical concert and they'll play rock and roll music, and they'll still be. You know, maybe it'll be a small cultural thing and there'll be something new going on. I don't know. But uh, I'm glad I lived through it. I mean, the 60s, 70s, 80s was a fucking great time, and 90s part of it, you know, it, to, to be alive, you know, and experience all that. In the era of the uh, the playlist and the, you know, buying individual songs, you guys have made a 71-minute record. Mm. Is it a shame that you can't kind of force people to hear it side one, side two in sequence? You know, that's a battle not worth fighting. Uh, those days are gone, you know, getting up to turn the record over to hear side two. That's, that's like a horse and buggy. It's beautiful, I still do it at home, but you can't expect new people to do it. They don't have that much, it's a different culture now. People are in a hurry, you know. Um, that might be a slightly dying art to sit down and take in a whole album like we used to. But um, it's, you know, when we, we look at it like, you know, we're not gonna, we can't worry about that. We're just gonna make the art 
the best we can the way we see it and hope people appreciate it, you know. They don't listen to the whole thing all at once. Well, that's their business, you know. We did it to be listened to, and hopefully most people will get it. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right. That's funny, finally.